What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Fish the Moment live stream number 60. Today, I'm joined by Matt Pangrak from Bass Talk Live BTL, and he's going to be breaking down his tournament on Sam Rayburn Lake, the Bassmaster Open. He had really good finish, finished in the top 40 of 200-something boats, so uh, really good finish. Matt, how's it going tonight? Good. Yeah, you've, you've done, done 60, 60 live streams already, John. 60 live streams. That's, that's a lot, lot of, of uh, that's, that's a, a lot, lot of information. information. Yeah, it's been really good. People seem to enjoy it. Bunch of people. We have regulars on. We got Ernest, Timo, Ron, uh, Christian, Aaron, Dave, Dean. Got guys who are always just like 20 minutes early sitting here. Wait, I'm sure it's like that <clears throat> for BTL too, right? You know, yeah, yeah. We got the guys who don't miss a show. It's awesome. That's cool. Well, um, man, I'm a huge fan of BTL. I'm sure a lot of the guys here are listening to that as well. If you guys aren't listening to Bass Talk Live, go download it on the podcast app and listen to it while you're driving to the lake. It's like the best show. It's like an hour long, which is perfect for any drive. Like for me, I listen to it when I go to Grand or Ten Killer or whatever, and it's just perfect. So awesome, big fan. Cool. Good well, deal. Um, you know, Matt, let's just jump straight into it because there's a lot to break down. We actually did a uh, prep video. We actually were having you prep for the event. And if there's a bunch of interest from you guys on that, we did Randy's prep video. Didn't seem like it got that big of a response. So if you guys are interested in seeing how Matt prepared for this tournament, his strategy and stuff, let me know because I have the video. We can just post it. Um, but what we want to do is kind of go over a recap of the event in general as well as Matt's specific strategy because he kind of did something very unique, which I think is going to be really interesting for you guys. He kind of fished the biggest community hole in the most obvious spot on the lake and no one was fishing it because it was almost like it was too obvious, which is really, really cool because when you hear about Jacob Wheeler talk or all these guys, Jacob's literally taking the wrap off of his boat, trying to idle the most sneaky, unobvious stuff to find fish, and yet you're able to just go to the community holes and catch him. It's super cool. Yeah. is it Was it Rodney Dangerfield who said, and I think the quote, I'm going to mess the quote up, Johnny, but the quote is something like, the place is always so crowded that nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> I think I ended up in one of those situations uh, in this tournament a, a, a little bit uh, to where I fully expected there to be eight to ten boats in my starting area, and there were, uh, like, two. <laughs> really? Man. Yeah. That's crazy. And you did something that you said you were not going to do. You swore it off on BTL in our video. You're like, I am not going to fish grass. You said you've caught... Literally zero fish punching grass before in a tournament. It was not what you were going to do. And that's how you caught most of your fish. Tell us how that happened. Yeah, so I went into this tournament, and the only experience I'd had on Sam Rayburn, uh, being from Oklahoma, was I had covered a couple of the – I covered Bass Fest, the Elite Series tournament, uh, with, with my job there with the Bass Zone. I think that was back in 2015. So I've covered a couple big tournaments there, uh, not fishing. And then I fished in the Costa Series, uh, which is now the Toyota Series, last June. Um, but last June, it was six foot high. Um, and I went to that uh, tournament knowing nothing about the lake. Um, and, and I mean, I knew that there were some places you shouldn't run. And I remember I called Brad Holman before the tournament and I said, how, how do you run this thing, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, it's six foot high, treat it like grain. So I just ran wherever I wanted to. Um, Black Forest, Amber Forest didn't make any difference to me. So I spent that entire tournament above uh, above the, uh, oh, is it, what is it, the 147? What is the name of that bridge? Right by Castle the Boykin, one, above the bridge. By yeah, Castle the, Boykin. right above the bridge there by Castle Boykins. Um, in the deer stand area and pofers and the canyons. Uh, and I'd never seen them uh, at normal pools, so I didn't know what they looked like or anything. I just started flipping and I got on like a pattern with hardwoods and, and, and totally avoided it, you know, any grass and grass didn't really play. And I had a top 10 in that coast I actually finished eighth place there. I'm um, like standing in line next to Dickie Newberry going, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> um, but it worked out really good and I had a big bite each day and I understood it. So I had a lot of positive momentum going in, was not planning on fishing, fishing grass. Cause I, I, I just don't have much experience at it. Uh, and it, became really apparent when I got here for this practice, my, my game plan was to go shallow. Um, and like I talked with you a little bit about, you know, kind of flip some isolated stuff and do the same because people were like, oh, there's still there's still stuff in the water in the canyons and stuff. And I went into the canyons and I was like, so this stuff's like a foot deep. It's hard to get to. It just looks kind of junky. Like it wasn't going that great. So I went out and I started graphing. I found some brush piles. 
uh, and I got a couple bites out of brush piles, but nothing that I felt like super confident on. And then it was like every place had tons of boats out there on the brush piles. Um, and I was seeing a lot of, of Texas anglers. There were 104 anglers in this field uh, from Texas. So, uh, I mean, there were a lot of good, good anglers in this, I think it was like 220 boat field. Um, and I was like, man, these brush piles are getting a lot of, a lot of pressure too. So I did that for a couple of days. Um, and I actually kind of stayed around the, my familiar zone. Um, and I ended up over in deer stand, uh, which is where I caught a lot of those fish when the water was up because I knew it had a good population over there. Uh, and I found some brush piles and some standing timber that I could get a bit cranking in. Uh, but as the, the practice went on, I was like, man, it just, it didn't feel like it was consistent. Like mm -hmm. it was a sure thing. You know what I mean? Like I could crank a, a DT uh, 14 or a DT 16 through the tops. And when I caught one, it'd be a two and a half pounder um, or a three pounder. But it was like, you never knew what brush pile. It wasn't like, oh, I can roll up to this one and catch it in there, or this one and catch it. And then you had to find them. And it was really time consuming. Um, so I just didn't have a ton of confidence in that. And I was like, I could see myself in the first morning. Uh, and I try to do a lot of visuals. Like, can I see myself rolling into this and it working up? And I'm like, no, I see myself rolling into this and like losing three crankbaits, not having <laughs> anything at 10 o'clock and going off crap. Um, so... I looked in Veach, um, and I talked to, uh, I had talked to a couple of people who were like, man, you know, if you want to look at the grass, there's good grass in Veach, there's good grass in this area. So, um, I went and I, I looked in Veach on like the second day of practice, which would have been Monday. There were like 70 boats in that place, man. It was absolutely slam packed. And there was like a, a channel swing place that I wanted to look at. And there were like six boats on it. And I remember just thinking like, this place is going to be trash by the time the tournament comes. But it's Sam Rayburn, and you know the fish are there. You know the fish are in the grass. So the more I started thinking about it, I was kind of like, man, I wanted to avoid the grass, but I just could not feel comfortable in the brush piles. So I decided to go back and look in the grass um, the day, uh, which would have been Tuesday, and actually got a couple bites out of it, which kind of opened my mind. I was like, well, maybe I could do a combination instead of shallow fishing and brush pile fishing. I had found a couple brush piles that I thought had some pretty decent fish because I kind of visited them once or twice and got bit. I was like, well, if I could find something in the grass and then the brush piles, I might be able to put together a limit. And that's how it ended up happening in the tournament for me. Got it. That's really cool. And that's what a lot of guys predicted before the tournament that you had to mix the shallow and the offshore as it turned out, the offshore bite was really strong. And actually, you were in the same area as like Daryl Gleason and the the winner from Japan. Mm -hmm. When you look back Josh at Douglas. it, Josh Douglas, yeah, all those guys were. When you went and actually like reviewed how everyone was fishing, were you a little bit, I guess, disappointed that you didn't try to push that brush pile bite a little bit further? And like, because they were running 30, 40, 50 brush piles yeah. a day. No, know? not at all. That. Daryl Gleason and I saw him um, in in practice a couple days. You know, talk to him at the at the ramp and things like that. And uh, I mean, that guy was out there to idle brush piles. And if he caught seven pounds a day, he was going to do it fishing brush piles. And if he caught twenty seven pounds a day, he was going to do it fishing brush piles. And the same went for uh, Josh Douglas and a number of those guys at the top. And I just wasn't willing. I mean, there were. A, there were a lot of guys that were in this area that did the exact same thing they did that didn't catch crap. Yeah. I mean, they, they struggled, they, they struggled to catch fish. And I really, my whole philosophy has been like, just stay in it long enough to have a chance. Yeah. Um, and like I'm 25th in the points now, but like, if I had a bad day, I was done. Like I'm waiting until 2021 for the Bassmaster Open. So, and I just never got the confidence except in about three or four different brush piles that, and I visited them consistently, and they were brush piles that I never saw anyone else on, and they were a little bit shallower, which is interesting, because uh, you take the social media, you take all everything that happened, a lot of those guys that caught them were like, yeah, I caught them on the shallower brush. Yep. Uh, even like eight to 12 foot, which was a mistake I made, because I didn't even look that shallow. I started catching them in like 14 to 16 foot brush piles, and was like, ah, oh, magic death. So then I, I dropped and didn't look anything deeper. I should have even looked shallower. Uh, but I only had like four or five ones that were shallow that I had confidence in, uh, but not enough that I thought I could catch a limit uh, offshore uh, on any brush piles. I ended up catching one that I waited on the first day off of a, a pile, and it was a five, 
nine, five, eight. Um, and then the very next drop, I hooked another five that I lost right at the side of the boat. Um, and then the second day I actually started on that stuff. I lost a big one, broke it off in the brush pile right off the start, caught two shorts and uh, went and punched two out of the grass and then came back and caught a third one out of the brush. So I literally had two stretches of grass and five brush piles. Um, and I took any other question out of any, any other option out of the equation. And I said, it's Sam Rayburn. I believe there are five good fish between these two stretches of grass and these five brush piles. And I don't need to even look anywhere else. So I took any decision making out of the equation and said, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in one of these five spots. You talked about that a lot in our prep video, how you like to really eliminate options for yourself. And I think that's one thing that a lot of guys listening to the stream can learn from is that you don't give yourself the entire lake as an option or every single pattern is an option. You go out after your practice or during your practice to eliminate pretty much everything. I think the way you say it is like, it's your strategy for how not to suck in tournaments. Like you might not win every tournament, but you're not going to have a 150th, 200 place finish. And I feel like that's really important. Can you explain that concept a little bit more to everyone? Yeah, I mean, technically that's not right because you can really easily have a 150 or 200 place finish here because a lot of your decision making is in which, you know, you can't sample everything because if you get bit doing everything, now you're back to square one. Like everything is still in play, right? You see what I'm saying? Yep. You get bit doing 10 things and you had 10 things on your front deck. Now, like, where are you after practice? Because you still have 10 options. Yep. So I like, I like to try to eliminate options because knowing me, if things don't go right, I'm going to start chasing things that happen and if I don't know what to chase or where to go I'll stay and when you're staying somewhere you're fishing and when you're fishing you have a chance to catch a fish so I try to spend whatever it is one day of practice two days of practice three days of practice finding something that I'm comfortable with that I believe that I can catch five in and then learning it as as well as I can and this is and I don't know if this is right or, or wrong this is just the way I do it I like to revisit spots like every day like okay uh, for for example um i i started punching grass um and the first place i went was a beach uh which had a bunch of grass in it so i wanted to look for something that was a, a little bit different because i talked to brad hallman and i said hey you know if i'm gonna punch grass what do you want he's like man you gotta find something different i remember listening to todd Faircloth say whenever you get a bite hit a waypoint once you get 10 bites, you'll start seeing clusters together. You'll say, hey, that's a juice bank. That's not a juice bank. You know, there's just one here. There were three here. Um, so I, I fished grass for like three hours down a stretch, and I ended up towards the back of beach. There were a couple little stretches where the channel kind of kind of swung in close, and it had a hard edge, and I got bit there. And it made sense to me, uh, punching uh, with a, a big bite bait BFE and a three-quarter or a one-ounce weight. It, it made sense to me. And it helped because 10 minutes after I started punching, I caught a four pounder hmm. and then I caught a two pounder and then I shook some off and then I caught another keeper. So I was like, okay, this, this makes sense, uh, to me. So I had seen how the brush piles were getting pounded and how they work, but I was like, man, there's a lot of fish that could live in this grass that wouldn't get pounded. So like I had comfort with that, but here's what I did then I went, I kept going back to that. So that was on, I think that was actually Monday because I remember I went back twice. So I went back in there Tuesday and I got bit, but I didn't set the hook and I shook it off. And then I was like, well, I wonder if they'll bite in the morning back in there. So instead of trying to find grass all over the lake and try to expand that pattern, I'm trying to dial in in a small area in the back of beach where the best areas are. Because we're Sam Raver, remember? There's fish everywhere on this lake. So then Wednesday morning, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start back there punching grass because I feel really confident that if they're there, they'll bite. But I don't know enough about grass that they bite in the morning. So I go back in there in 10 minutes, I shake three off. No one's back in there in beach right now. So now I know I've got my starting spot and I've got tons of confidence in it. Because even though I've never punched grass and I've never seen this area before in my life, three days in a row at different times of the day, I've been able to go in there and get a bite within 10 minutes. That's super so cool. that that's how I gained confidence in that. So when I went back in there and then I had another area, um, so like the channel swung close up against the bank and I got bit there. 
So I was like, well, where else can it? So I looked at my Navionics chip and I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, uh, there's a, I don't know if I'm in the right. You're in Harvey right now. Yeah, I'm in Harvey. So yeah. I need to go down to Veach. So the channel swings right, you know, right close to the bank, yep. right? So I'm looking. So then I went and I spent a couple hours over here because it looked like the channel swung back in this side. And I know this is all stuff that guys fish a lot. I mean, it's nothing. I mean, I expected there to be a ton. And I saw that the channel came back here. So I went and I looked back here. I went in the very back here because I saw where the channel swung in this this corner here. And I started looking. And then I went in this next little pocket and I said, ah, there it is right there. And the channel kissed up against the bank there, very similar to the way that it did down here. And I got bit here and I got bit here. Didn't get bit. I had like one bite over here, but no clusters. I had a cluster here and I had a cluster here. So those were my two grass banks. And I didn't try to look for anything else. And I said, I know there's five fish in this 100 yard stretch and five fish in this 100 yard stretch. Um, so I was totally confident when I was running, I had no decision to make. I was just going to one spot. And if someone was in that spot, I'd go to the other spot. So I took the decision making out. There's, there were tons of stuff over in this big giant area here. Dude, I never even went in there. I have like no idea what was in there. <sighs> Like, like I have no idea where else there was grass on the lake. Like I didn't, I didn't look in Caney. I didn't look down south. I didn't look anything. I just knew I had those two little stretches. Took the decision making out because I was com, you know, comfortable that there were fish in that. Well, I I think that's really insightful too because one, when I go fishing, even like I do these shallow versus offshore challenges with randy and we go fishing and i have i go to a lake you know where i haven't maybe been there for three weeks two months a year even and i have to try to find offshore fish and randy has to try to find shallow fish and what we find is that whenever especially for me whenever i start catching fish as soon as i get a single bite or maybe a couple bites in an area i will then say i'm not going to move more than 200 yards from where I caught these fish. And I'm going to find every single piece of cover. Because usually if you can catch, like let's say two fish out of a brush pile, if you can find mm -hmm. any other brush pile in that same depth with the same contour elements, you have a good chance of catching more fish. And that's what happened here with your grass. If you look where you are in Veach, you stayed within maybe a 200 to maybe half mile, 200 yard to half mile yep. section. And if you go another mile away maybe those fish aren't setting up in that same depth on that same type of grass and you have to re-establish that pattern i think that's really cool because then you you maximize that and if you're getting four bites per spot even if you have two or three spots that's enough and i think that's yeah. one thing that a lot of guys mess up on in tournaments especially is that one the second you leave an area you have to relearn it which means you start your whole day's worth of understanding over and you're running to an area where maybe someone else has already fished it or done whatever, a lot of times it's better to just pick a 200-yard, 300-yard stretch and fish there. And you talk about that on Grand as well all the time. Like, find that area, fish that area, and that's it. Don't go anywhere else. Yeah, well, the key is don't go anywhere else as long as you believe that there's there, those fish live there, which is why I'm going back and revisiting it over at different times of the day different sunlight, cloudy, windy, calm. Like if I'm consistently getting bit, that's that's developing my confidence in an area. It's not like, hey, I got bit here and I'm not going to adjust, I'm not gonna change and I'm not gonna search during the day. Yeah. Like, I stayed there because I never had that hopeless feeling. You ever had that hopeless feeling where you're like, oh, yeah. you're like flipping and you're like, well, I don't know what else to do, so I guess I'll stay here, but this place sucks and I don't feel like I'm gonna get a bite here or anything. Like, yep. I maximized those areas, and I did that with the, the, the brush piles uh, over by the bridge, too, that were that I felt were productive, because I always felt like I had a chance to get bit out of it. And that's what I search for, is a chance to feel like I'm fishing productive water. And I would rather refish productive water that I feel like is productive, whether it is or not, it's a confidence thing for me. I would rather refish water that I feel like is productive then randomly fish water where I don't have a feeling like it's productive. And sometimes you can fish new water and feel like it's totally productive. It's just in this instance, on this lake with a fish population and as pressured as it got with a big field coming off of a holiday weekend, 
I was happy as long as I was fishing somewhere where I felt like I was being productive, and it just happened to be those two little stretches. When you establish there's a school of fish there, when you get three bites out of a mm -hmm. stretch of grass, you know there's a school of fish there. And the one thing I talk about all the time in my videos is feeding windows. There's little two hour or 45 minute windows throughout the day where those fish are going to start chewing. Like let's say the a front moves through, the wind starts blowing on that grass, you might mm -hmm. absolutely wreck them down that stretch if you're there in that moment. But then you might go three hours without a bite, but that school of fish isn't gone anywhere. It's still there. It's just it's not actively feeding at that moment. So again, this is, I think for a lot of guys, this is one of the most beneficial tips if you're struggling to tournament fish is to not fish the entire lake. You can't be successful unless you have a ton of experience. If you're like a, a local, like a Daryl Darryl Gleason who knows mm -hmm. where all these different areas are, and maybe he knows that in this section of the lake over by the mouth of Veach, you can catch him in 20-foot brush piles. Then over in the Black Forest, you can catch him in 14-foot brush piles. Then over in um, you know north of the bridge, you can catch him in 8-foot brush piles. Unless you dial that in, it's so hard to in a even a three-day practice to get that dialed mm -hmm. unless you're local again so yeah so, so i've spent uh between, between the, the coastal coast last year and, and the bass master, master open, open this year i had four days five seven eight nine ten eleven thirteen days on sam raver i have <laughs> this is this is bad i've, I've never, never made a cast below beach except, except like with, with five, five minutes, minutes left right by the ramp and I have and never made a cast above the the uh, split in the uh, in the uh, river, you know, like above yep. deer stand. Yep. So, so every, every single cast I've ever made in 30 days uh, has been between deer stand and beach. Like yeah. I don't know, I don't even know what the rest of the lake looks. like. <laughs> well, that's good because Sam Rayburn's huge. I mean, the if you go into the other arm, it's a completely different lake almost with different types of vegetation, right. everything. It's like you have to relearn. I mean, I know a lot of guys who fish small lakes and stuff, they understand this. They're like, when they go to a big lake, it's so overwhelming because Sam Raymond is literally 10 lakes in one a lot of times. That's the same thing with Table right. Rock, the same thing with Grand. The fish don't act the same all over the lake. They act the same in every mile stretch. Or no, so. and, and one, one of the things, things you talk, talk to, like, like these experts, experts on the lake, we actually had Matt Reed on, who's really good on uh, Sam Rayburn and those Texas lakes, lakes. and he, he talked, talked about learning the lake in chunks, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, you know, if you're going out for a weekend and you want to, you want to run, uh, past the 103 bridge one day and then fish down by the dam the next day, like you're not really going to learn anything. And he's like, you have to learn the lake in chunks. And, and I think it's interesting. Um, when I first started fishing grand, it was back in, you know, I moved to Oklahoma in the mid 2000s. I got the bus, started fishing grand in like 2008, 2009. And, uh, I started, I started fishing the nickels, one day events, you win a boat for first, seconds, 10 grand, rest of the payout, like you get your money back. Um, and I remember Mark Jeffries from BTO was like, dude, you can never compete with those, you know, with those guys down there. You'll never, you know, Alan Head, Gary Carrier, Sean and all those guys, like, you'll, you can't do that. You're driving three hours, staying at a hotel, fishing the thing for three days. Like those guys have 30 years of experience. Um, and it kind of ticked me off. So I like started going down there. And one thing like that, that time, so like that mid 2009 to 2013, 14, before that ramp was built in Wolf Creek, like everything was one down lake. Uh, that was before the zebra mussels had gotten in there for a couple of years and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, why would you fish up lake for 15 pounds when almost everything is one mid down with 22 to 25 pounds? Uh, and, and it's, it's a, a one-day one day tournament. tournament. So, so I, just I just started, started learning, like, like little coves and little things in there to where, where I would spend, like, three or four days in, like, one cut. Yeah. And side image it and fish it and learn it really well. Because, I mean, on Grand, it was the same as that. The fish population, it's different now. But the fish population, then it's like, okay, there's five five-pounders five in here. And if and you can, can learn this and turn this into a pond, who cares what's in the rest of the lake? lake. If, if you, you get, get good at this and treat this cove like nothing else exists, you can compete, compete with anybody who knows 60,000 60, acres because, because you know 5,000 5, acres. And if they're in your 5,000 5, acres, it doesn't matter how well you know the other 55. Oh yeah. You just have to pick the right stuff. So, so, and, and then, then it's easy, easy because, because you don't have any decisions. decisions. You're not like, like running, running and you're like, oh my God, this thing is so big. You're just like, yeah, I'm going to that cut, that creek arm. I'm going to learn it. 
And then you, know, you, learn, you learn it, and you're like, like oh, yeah, I get bit here, and I get bit here, and they use this, and there's a channel edge here. And now you take something that's massive, and you've shrunk it down, it's like going to a pond. Exactly. I mean, that's what I used to do when I used to fish tournaments all the time on Lake Dardanelle. And I was like a local basically down there. I was with, ran with like the top eight or nine guys down there. And when I would fish out there, there was guys that could run up to Spadger, which is way up the river, shallow, dirty water. There's guys who fish in the creeks. There's guys who fish down by the, the Illinois Bayou, lower in the lake. What I decided is I'm going to learn two areas of the lake. And those are the only two areas mm-hmm. I'm going to learn to fish. And I'm going to learn Delaware Bay and Piney Bay because it gets less pressure than the other places and I'm just going to fish it. And I won a lot of tournaments, a lot of Tuesday nighters, a lot of stuff like that fishing against the locals because I just learned that area so well. And I knew that in those two areas, there's big fish, just like you said. And I just learned them. And yeah, the fish were different every time when I would go there. I had to use different techniques. I had to fish shallow, deep, everything, but I never went anywhere else. And to this day, there's areas in Lake Dardanelle I've never been to despite being my home lake. And I've heard that from a lot of guys on Sam Rayburn, even like uh, Todd Castledine. Mm-hmm. Sam Rayburn, you know, local, knows everything. He said for this tournament, he practiced in a creek that he'd never been to in his life. How can you have a creek on Rayburn you've never been to in your life? Well, he's been successful in certain areas of the lake, and why go anywhere else when you know that that's where the good quality fish are? So it, I, mm-hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah it's... it's uh... Uh... And, and I, I call, call it, it's the Brian, Brian Thrift Pack. It's called the spoke. I, I call it the spoke and hub pattern, yeah. right? Yep. So, so picture, picture you have this wheel. wheel. So, so you're, you're spending, spending your practice. You're trying to, what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the hub of that wheel. wheel. You're trying to find the, you start out with nothing and you find, and sometimes you don't ever find it and you suck in the tournament. Sometimes you get lucky, you don't ever find it. I mean, but. Once, Once you start, you start doing, doing it over and over, you, you find something that you're comfortable with. In, in this case, case, it was something I didn't expect to be comfortable with, but it was those stretches of grass. grass. Like, like, I felt that was my hub. Like, like I could go get bit there, there right? Yep. Um, so, so then, then you start, start finding spokes, spokes that, that come, come out from that hub. So this is my central pattern. This is where this is where I feel comfortable. Like, And you can't fake it. You either know you feel comfortable or you know you're screwed. I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? Yep. So, so if you, you feel, feel comfortable, comfortable, you're like, okay, okay I got, got my hub. hub. Now, now you start exploring little spokes. So like, uh, like, like when I was uh, down, down there in beach. So like, like okay, if this if this whole area, area this random area is my hub, hub I'm gonna start exploring little little little, little, little spokes, spokes, and it's not gonna, gonna work out. It's just an hour stuck in here, thirty minutes, whatever. So now I need to 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 start getting some spokes so I can get a wheel. Well, one of those spokes happened to be brush pile, like. In, in one, one area of the lake, lake that I had several bites on in practice, practice. I, did I did the same, same thing in the grass. grass. I went back, I'd cast, I'd shake them off. Or I'd catch one on a crankbait and leave and be like, okay, they're here at noon. No, I started one morning there. Okay, they're here. Because you need five fish a day. Like You don't have to know the whole lake. Like, I don't know the whole lake. I have no idea on Sam Rayburn. Like, if someone was like, explain Sam Rayburn, I was like, I can explain two spots to you, two areas. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, but, but then, then like, another like another spoke was like, like okay, I haven't had a bite for an hour and a half on these stretches of grass. I fish the same ones. I know they're here, but they're just not biting. So let's go run over and see if they're, and see if I can pick one off the brush pot. So like that was a, a spoke to it. So while I'm sucking in the grass, it keeps me calm because I know I got these brush piles that I might go get bit on. And then when I go to the brush piles, I'm still calm because I'm like, well, if, if I don't, don't get, get bit here, here I've, I've given that, that grass, grass a rest and I could go back and catch them out of the grass. Yeah. So, so basically my whole pattern was like keeping me from spinning out. That's really good stuff. And and I think that that's a different approach too that really complements your personality and your style. Because if you think about how Randy prepared for the tournament and we put that video out there, he literally said, I'm going to fish shallow. I can't compete deep. And all he's going to do is he went into the back of a creek stuck in the back of this creek and he's fishing mm-hmm. cypress trees in six inches to a foot of water we'll have his rayburn video of him catching his fish once he gets back from the heart well open we'll get that video up and he basically stuck in the back of this creek he had 12 pounds the first day i think he had like eight pounds the second day but he lost like three around four or four and a half pounds so he would have had a chance to be in that top 50 top 40 range mm-hmm. just fishing shallow now I talked to Randy about how I would fish this, and actually, I made a video too preparing for this. I'm not going to post that one because um, I I just don't feel like you guys would be as interested. But 
in that video, I literally said if I was going to go prepare for this tournament, I would only fish offshore the entire tournament. I would graph for four days straight. That's all I would do. And I would pick four sections of the lake for the four days of practice. And I would just graph. And I would figure out which area I felt like was the most productive. And I might make 200 casts all of practice and just mm-hmm. graph and graph and graph. Because I know kind of like what the guys who were at the top were doing – I don't care if I don't catch a fish for seven hours offshore because I know all it takes is hitting three of the right brush piles in a row and I'm catching 20 pounds. And for me, that I never get spun out fishing offshore because I've had so many experiences now where I go all day without catching them and then I pull up on the spot and catch them. Mm-hmm. So I'm never concerned. I've never was concerned in tournaments. I would do that all the time for years and I just didn't care. Like if I didn't have a fish at one o'clock, it didn't matter. It was funny. I tell the story all the time, but like there was a college when we fished the U- University of Arkansas College uh team my first year in the club uh, my partner and i won angler of the year we never caught a single fish before noon and all of our weigh-ins were at two o'clock and we won three of the six tournaments and never finished out of top three and we won angler of the year never caught a fish before noon and it was because we fished offshore every tournament and i was just graphing and just looking most of the time and it just happened in those six tournaments it was so weird my partner he would literally start bringing textbooks with him while I was graphing around, he was reading this. Graphing. Yeah, because I'd be graphing, and I'd find them eventually, funny. but mm-hmm. like it never spun me out. But for yeah. you, if you did that, I feel like you'd be a, a hot mess halfway through the day yeah. without so the fish in the boat. One of the things I realized, which which my goal, I mean, everyone's like, well, how could you go into a tournament not one, not expecting to win it or not saying you're not going to win it? But like, my goal is. Like, if you look back at the history of the Bassmaster Opens, the Centrals, the Easterns, take them to any lake. Like, if you catch five two-and-a-half-pounders, it's a decent fish. Like, that's really good at the Arkansas River. It's average at Grand. It's below average at Rayburn. But if you can just go catch five two-and-a-half-pounders and weigh in a limit, yep. you, like, are going to cash checks, you're going to be in the hunt, and you're then going to be one or two bites away from being at the top. So like, was I willing to sacrifice bites to go out and graph that? Like, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Like maybe I just didn't have a big enough set like Douglas and Gleason did to put all my eggs in that basket because I could see what the downside of that was. I wanted something to where I could be like, I got five, I got 12 pounds. Now I'm one bite away. Like, I would rather be one or two bites away from cashing a check at 1 o'clock than five bites away from having a limit at 1 o'clock. And that's the way I was looking at it. In, in the Bassmaster Opens and in any points tournament, um, and then you get to the championship or you get to a point where you have to win or be in the top five, well, then your decision's taken away. You don't have to fish for a limit because it doesn't matter if you have a limit because you're either in the championship or you win or no one remembers you or you're in a position where – you have to catch a big bag to stay alive. Yep. Like the, everything that I do is trying to take take decisions away. Yeah. Like the less I think, and I feel like there's a lot of guys who overthink. Oh, yeah. Like everything that I do, whether it's a one-day club tournament or a Bassmaster Open, is knowing that I have a tendency to, to spin out, or did. I haven't done it in like three or four years now. Like I haven't had a spin-out tournament. Yep. Like you watch, you can go on the BTL YouTube channel. I mean, dude, I lost like a six pounder at <laughs> my hand. I only had four at one o'clock, but like I've navigated that. I understand what type of personality I am. Yep. I mean, dude, if you're the type of personality that can be out there at 1230 with no fish in your libel and you're like, dude, it's going to happen and I have confidence it's going to happen, then good for you. But like, I like having 12 pounds, 11 pounds in my box at, at that and then going from there. Well, it's just a, a style difference too. Cause like, yeah. well, I also know that if I try to go fish up shallow, I'm going to suck. Cause like, I'm not great at fishing shallow. So like, mm-hmm. that's not my skill set. And if I don't catch them offshore, I'm not going to catch them offshore and I'm going to suck regardless. So like, mm-hmm. for me, it's not like I have a lot of, I, I don't give myself the option to, to have a backup. So it's not like, I feel like I'm always going to catch them. It's just a matter of that's where I, I'm confident that I'm going to catch him. Not that I feel like I'm always going to. And that's the difference there of like, you have to, you know, do that. And I, 
I mean, I've seen people here, they're like, man, I can't believe you did the, the thing in college. And it's like, it's very easy if I did that, that I also could have not caught a single fish and zeroed. It worked out that, that season. The next year, I didn't win Angler of the Year. Like, I, it just happened that one season. It worked out that well. So, like, you, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Kind of like what Randy does. He goes yeah, and shallow 100%. and, like, that's it. If they're not biting him shallow, it's not happening. Where your approach is definitely more geared towards that consistency, the versatility. Mm-hmm. What you have seen, though, is you don't have as many of the top, top finishes, like the wins and stuff. But you also don't have as many of the bombs. Like if you look at a Tommy Biffle, back in the day he was first or he was not doing very hot in a lot of the events. Like that's Mm -hmm. that swing for the fence mentality. And it's just personality and style. I don't think there's a wrong way to do it. I think it's cool that you can go all different approaches and still be successful to an extent. Yeah, and I mean, I know you. if you're – you have got, got people who are watching this. I mean, is your goal to win a tournament, to win a boat in a one-day event? Is it to make the championship event? I mean, it, it, it all is different. Like, I've always just been, man, you can't win it unless you get there. So that's why I try to – I really like high percentage stuff, wacky one, drop shot, flat side square bills. Uh, you know, I've got a system. We haven't even talked about that yet. BMR yeah. squared, Bridgers Marina, Rip Rap, and Ramps. We're going to do a video like, on that for sure. Yeah, just like stuff to get you to the end goal because, I mean, that's the goal. Like, you want to make the state team or you want to make the championship event. But, I mean, if you're fishing a a one-day deal and you know 27 pounds is going to win it and 15 pounds gets you 500 bucks and you split it with your buddy in a team tournament and it's $250 a piece, probably not the best strategy. But when you're investing $14,000 in it and your goal is not to be out of it going to the next tournament. So like, think of it this way, four Bassmaster Opens, right, Johnny? Yep. Let's just say 200, 200 people there. Uh, Basically, you have to have a top 20, 25 finish average to, to be in contention to finish in the top five or six in the angler of the year. So right off the bat, um, you've got like, 75 guys that are done the bottom 75 guys like even if you basically unless you win like all three in a row you still won't even average that right so arkansas river didn't hurt didn't do myself any favor 62nd place um but still in it right so now i go to rayburn and i'm like okay i I can't do a 62nd but i'm still in it i'm not one of the guys that's out of it so i gotta do i gotta do a top 40 Yep. I ended up finishing 38th place. So now I look at it. I'm 25th in the place. I'm doing the points. I'm like, okay, well, I'm halfway through the year. And now you've got over half the field done. So now you're down to like 60 guys for four spots. So in two tournaments, I'm still one of those guys. I'm still one of the bottom. But because of the decisions that I've made, I'm still in it. So now I've got to go to Neely Henry. And I've got to have a top 20, right, in three weeks. So by by – I'm going to start taking more risks as I get it. I'm going to take the risks that I feel is appropriate to keep me in. Like, I'm not going to take a risk to completely tank there, but I've got to catch them there. So my decision-making is going to be a little bit different than it was at at Sam Raber. Because of 50th place finish there, I'm out of it. So here's a question for you then, Matt. With When you think about this tournament trail, because I think this is really insightful too for guys. Like If you're a local one-day derby fisherman, mm-hmm. you don't need to take this approach that Matt's talking about, the kind of conservative, get a limit, get 12 pounds. Because like, if you finish ninth, you're not making a check anyways. But what Matt's talking about is this approach is the way to get the long-term you know, qualifying for Angler of the Year, qualifying for the Classic or the, uh, the Bassmaster Elite Series. One thing I think is really cool in that is that you're adjusting your risks as you go through. But while you're doing this, do you ever kind of think about, hey, this tournament, for example, Rayburn, this didn't play to my strengths, so I'm going to take less risks versus Neely Henry. It's going to fish to my strengths. So I know that in these of these four tournaments, I have a better chance to take a risk at these lakes this time of year versus others. Or is that not really play into it? Does it more happen off your practice and stuff? Yeah, it just kind of bases off how comfortable I feel after practice. Gotcha. Like... Like on, uh, sometimes you're like, you have that feeling like I don't have a limit and other times you're just comfortable and you understand things and you're like, okay, but I know based on 
what has happened the last four days, I will get a keeper bite in the next three hours. So I'm not going to spin out. So it just kind of, so then you're more likely to take a risk if you kind of have something in your back pocket where you know, okay, something will happen in the last couple hours to where it'll bite. But if you know, like, okay, I've gone long stretches without keeper bites here. That's when you need to start kind of assessing your risk, in my opinion. Yeah. That's really smart. I mean, it and it makes perfect sense because, like you said, you're still in position. And now, I mean, if you let's say you get a 35th place finish at Neely Henry, you know, at the last tournament, you need let's say this place finish. You can just swing for the fences there and then treat it like a you know more like a one day derby yeah. style where you just go where you think the big fish are and just swing. And if you miss, I mean, it doesn't really it, it's yeah. not going to affect you. I mean, so, do I mean? Let's be honest. I mean, I'm not like I'm saying I have this like perfected magic no, thing yeah. i'm just saying what works for me i mean you, you just look at my finishes i mean i've kept consistently you know checked for the last three or four years at a, at a state and a regional level on multiple lakes across the country kind of doing the same thing but like i mean by no means do i have like this thing figured out um it's just you start noticing certain patterns and certain things that you consistently do on different bodies of water that allow you to feel comfortable and like you you start doing the same things on different bodies of water and you never end up with a with difficult decisions if that makes sense It it, it because i feel like there's tons of guys who are like you know if i'm fishing and i'm thinking about the next spot or where i need to go or what i need to do like, dude, I'm so screwed. And I know it. And you don't even realize it at the time, but you look back on it and you're like spending all your time thinking about what you're doing next. Even when you're not catching them, when you're you're comfortable, you just do it. Like yeah. you you're just you're there. You it might not work out or something like that, but you don't have that angst. You don't end up driving down the lake going, Oh my gosh, am I going to miss out something on here by going here? It's just, it just happens naturally. And that's something you can't force. And I feel like I've, I've put myself in that bind less and less the more that I've kind of figured out how to practice and, and pinpoint what jacks with my head and how to alleviate that pressure during practice. So it might not be like that for your viewers and people watching this. It might be something totally different. It might be like, you know what, I'm not going to fish for a limit and I'm only going to fish out deep. Or it might be, you know, it's all sorts of different stuff. It's like I'm going to sample everything and maybe not catch them very good doing anything, but then whatever first thing comes into my mind tournament morning, that's what I'm going to do. It's just totally different. What I'm saying is like realize what your weaknesses are and then figure out how to eliminate those weaknesses during your three days of practice. I, I think that's really, really smart. And it's it's really comes down to learning your personality and what makes you successful. Because I feel like from listening to Bass Talk Live the last two, three years, I feel like you've really come a long way in learning yourself more than anything. And I think that you know what makes you successful, what situations are good, what situations are bad. And you are able to also explain that really, really well. And I think that for the audience, that's important. It's not just man, I didn't catch him today because I wasn't throwing the right bait in the right area. A lot of mm-hmm. times it's you didn't game plan. It's the mental side of it that definitely just by listening to you, you are definitely getting that down a lot more than I think a lot of anglers. And you're thinking about a lot more than a lot of other anglers are. And I know there's a lot of guys at the top who maybe they don't think about it at all. They just go fishing and they just catch him. And it's like, oh, why have to worry about that? But that's not everyone. So I think they're, it's very helpful for a lot that's of guys. That's like no one, dude. <laughs> No, like, like even the guys who you think are like that. I look, okay, take like a Brandon Polinick, for example. Yeah. He would fish like 300 days a year when the time he was 16 to 20. He has 15 years of experience for a weekend guy that he crammed into three years. So the guy's 20 years old, but he did from 17 to 20, and he was able to build on it because he was put day after day after day instead of weekend, not do it for a couple of weeks, then another weekend. So you take the time on the water that he had from 17 to 20 years old when he was traveling around. It's literally what a hardcore weekend guy does in 15 years. Yeah. So they're like, oh, he's natural. No, it's time on the water. There's literally nothing that, that, that does it. And time on the water helps your mental game. Like what's Kevin Van Dam's uh, adage? He says, it's all about the attitude. What's I can say? Fish the moment. You listen to any of Brandon's stuff. Like any of those guys who are good, like, dude, how many people do you know who can cast as good as you, Johnny? There's thousands. Yep. 
There's stuff st- I can, I mean, yeah, yeah I might not be able to cast a crankbait, crankbait as far as KBD, but, but like mechanically, like, 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 I mean, I can, can flip, flip, I can pitch, I can pitch, skip, I can cast. cast. Why yeah, are those guys, guys like winning and, and all that stuff? stuff. It's, it's not because they're making, you know, minute color changes or can do stuff better than a lot of other people. It's a hundred percent. They understand what makes them tick. Yep. For sure. For sure. Well, Matt, we're going to take a quick uh, break here for a second. I want to talk to about some stuff with the viewers, but while yep. we're doing that, can you pull up uh, Lake Cumberlings? I want to kind of talk about how you did over there last time because okay. it's really cool with what you did. Basically, you were able to um, use a similar method where you focus on a small section of the lake to catch those fish as opposed to trying to go fish all over the place. And yeah. it's kind of similar to what you did on uh, on Rayburn. So I think that that's really, really cool. So let's um, have you pull that up. But then I'm actually going to talk to you guys really quick about some stuff that we have on fishthemoment.com. We always do this at some point through the stream. And just want to let you guys know about some of the products we're offering. This is obviously what I do for a living with Randy. And we're actually offering some virtual seminars coming up that have been really popular the first one coming up here is the Advanced Jerkbait Fishing Seminar from Randy. He's going to be talking about when, where, and how to fish jerkbaits. And he is a jerkbait master. He actually, did you know he helped design the Vision 110 jerkbait, Matt? No, I did not. Yeah, so he was like, he was sending the original like Smithwick Rogues over to Megabass in Japan. Like went over to Japan and helped design that bait. So he knows yeah, all about the Vision 110. <laughs> <laughs> and he he is so good at jerkbait fishing especially in the fall and the winter and he's doing a seminar on that we're going to be showing you the best areas retrieves conditions techniques super in-depth there's only 30 spots available and i think there are only five spots left in the seminar so definitely check that one out i'm also going to be doing an advanced bass fishing uh offshore bass fishing seminar where i'm going to be getting into how to become a more efficient and effective offshore angler in terms of how to rotate offshore spots to hit those feeding windows effectively, how to maybe not lose confidence if you go four or five hours without catching fish offshore, and how to pay attention to conditions to set yourself up for success, as well as also finding some of those hidden offshore areas that are a little bit off the wall. Something that I'm really big uh, nerd on, I spent all my time focusing on offshore fishing and how to catch them offshore, so Mm -hmm. something that I feel like I can definitely help you guys out with, so check that out. And I'm also going to be doing an advanced bass fishing electronics seminar on November 12th. I've done three of these so far. They always fill up like two weeks ahead of time. So I wanted to throw this out like way out ahead for you guys. Sign up if you want to, you know, learn about electronics with me. I know you guys watch my videos. You know, I'm uh, really good with the electronics, side imaging, down imaging, stuff like that. So I can definitely help you out there. Um, or at least I think I am. You can watch my videos and uh, check for yourself. And then also uh, for the uh, other guys if you have a tournament coming up in the fall or you're just struggling to find fish we also offer fish the moment map breakdowns where we actually mark up maps with 60 different spots on lakes all across the country by season and we give you four different areas of the lake to test out and these are all created by randy blockett you know 30 year tour veteran and if you guys do want to check those out just head to fish the Awesome. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. And then otherwise, uh, let's head over to Matt again. And let me switch back over to you. There we go. Cool. So um, Matt, tell us a little bit about Lake Cumberland. You kind of used your hub and spoke method on Cumberland to explain what's going on. And I think that it was very similar in a sense to what you did in Veach. And I want you to explain how that happened because you were really successful at Cumberland. I think you had a top, top three. Yeah. Third finished place, third, third, third place. place. Yeah. Championship That's awesome. Last year. Um, had never, never been, been there before. before. So, so I did, I did, I did the, the same, same, the same, same similar, similar thing. thing. I, I wanted, wanted to establish before I went there an area that I knew felt had the winning fish in it. We're talking about championship championship event event here. So So this this is for all the marbles, marbles, right? Um, So I uh, talked to a buddy who lived down there, and and he gave me three or four creeks. Um, And and they were from the lower end all the way to the upper end of it. And we took out a bird side. Um, So I went 
What do I feel most comfortable with? Grand Lake. So, you know, we took out a Burnside way up here. This is a river fishery. It is like 55 miles long. So I started looking at how past tournaments had been won. Brian Thrift, uh, Wenlit, when he was leading that tournament, a lot of his stuff. And I realized I would be most comfortable on this lower end. I'm not gonna fish mud flats, I fish for large mouth in the back, plus small mouth are cool, and I like doing that type of stuff. So I put in it at the dam, the first day of practice. This is crazy, because this is actually how this worked out. <laughs> Put it right here at the dam, right? You see the dam right here? Yep. And I went over into Indian Creek. And I went to the back of Indian Creek. And there were like 20 boats back there. And they were all largemouth fishing. And I said, well, this is not going to work. Because I just, I had in my mind, here's what I see. You go to the back of a creek, five days people have been blasting them. There ain't going to be any resident fish back there. Yep. So I start working my way out on the first day of practice, and I get short of this marina here, and I'm like, I know they catch them on a uh, rock crawl or wiggle wart, that type of stuff, and I have like three or four big smallmouth beaded on rock bluff. So I go back, and I refish it in practice, like really fish it hard, and I catch like four or five. I have like 18 pounds of smallmouth off of a couple of different stretches back here, but I'm learning one. I mean, it's five days before the tournament. So for the next four days, I went a little bit into, I think this is Beaver Creek over here, um, and Otter. Like I went a little bit into these two creeks and just a hair into, uh, I don't ever remember it being called Greasy Creek. Greasy Creek. It's, <laughs> it's called there. I don't remember it being called that. Uh, Jamestown is what I remember it being called. Gotcha. I spent a couple hours in there. I pretty much spent five days uh, in uh, in Indian Creek. Hmm. So I developed my hub right there where I had like five or six different stretches. And I figured out when it was sunny, they need the translucent, uh, the translucent bait better than the hard red bait. And I'm, you know, I'm catching the right caliber of fish. And I'm not like jacking on them in here. I'm just fishing a bunch of different stuff. You know, you know, I'd go, go back, back and just hit like a 10 yard, yard stretch that I thought and if I caught one, I'd be good. So then I was like, okay, I got to find something else in here. So, so now I start looking for spokes, spokes right? Yep. So, so my hub is, I'm making this long run. run. So, so I, I found my hub. hub. My, my hub, hub is down here. I don't really care about any of this part of the lake. So much so that the first time I saw anything from Burnside all the way to Jamestown was the first morning of the tournament when I ran, ran past all of it down to Indian Creek. Hmm. And as, as it turns out, tons of guys stayed up here, fished yeah. up here, it made top tens up here. I had no idea what was up there. I don't have any idea, I still don't have any idea what's up there because I just drove past it three times. Well, two, my boat broke down on the third day, so Rob Burns drove past it the third day. Um, so I got my hub here, so now I start looking for spokes. I know they got spotted bass. Spotted bass like to be around cover and stuff, so I start looking in creeks. I find this little this little cut right here. There's like a sunken barge in the middle of it. Always had fish on it. I checked it every single day. Now here's the thing I realized. Sometimes it had 12-inch spotted bass on it. Sometimes it had three-pound smallmouth on it. Sometimes it had largemouth on it. I ended up catching a key fish there all three days of the tournament. The only reason I had the confidence to go back was because I never knew what would be on it because I'd fished it for five days. Now, I wasn't catching them on it. I had a screw in lock. I wasn't hooking the fish, but uh, I could tell whether they were, you know, a little spot or a big fish or whatnot. So that was a little bit. So then when I started to, to, to come out on the main lake, I saw, so now I'm looking for stuff like in this general area that spokes because my hub is going to be cranking right in here i think i can do 15 to 17 a day cranking and i find like little blow downs on the main river channels so like right out in here wherever that channel this little bank right here this little bank right here this little bank right here and there'd be like trees that were falling down in the water like the bigger spotted bass would be in those trees i just pitch a drop shot up there i call like a three pounder on it the first day uh, that, that really helped, and, and I filled my, or the second day, and I filled my limit out with it on the first day, and then the final day I had a chance to win, and I, I thought I had a better chance of smallmouth, so I didn't do it at all. Um, but, so, 
had my, my hub. hub. My hub was cranking down, down there. there. Had, had no, no decisions to make because, because I didn't spend, spend any time on this massive 55 mile fishery of what, what to do. do. So, so I had, had one decision, decision which was drive 55 miles down there, there crank, 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 do a little bit of the, the spoke stuff, stuff if I needed to, and, and then, then drive all the way back. back. And, and that's how I fished that whole tournament. That's awesome. Well, it's very similar to what you did in Veach as well, because you found 100%. those schools. And I think that that's something that I've been learning more and more over the last three or four years is that there are 200 yard stretches to a mile stretch where just there's a better population of active bass living. And if you can get in that section, for whatever reason, you can just go in there and regardless of the conditions, whether it's windy, cloudy, you can find a way to get those fish to bite. And then if you can expand and find every little nook, every rock transition, brush pile, whatever, mm -hmm. you can catch them in there and you can fish the rest of that creek and not hardly catch anything. The biggest challenge though is obviously finding the hub. Yeah. And it, you got fortunate in this term where you found it in the first day but it might take you four or five days to find it at times. Does that sound right? Right, absolutely. Now, here's the deal. When this works and you find it, it's very manageable. There is low stress. You know what you're going to do. You have no decision to make. When you don't find it and your plan going into that tournament is this strategy, total cluster. Because now... <laughs> now, now you don't, don't have, have anything. anything. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, yep. I mean, dude, I finished a hundred and something in Amistad last year. I finished like 80th, 90th at Lake of the Ozarks. Dude, I never found a hub. Like I never found that deal I was comfortable with. So what do I have to work on? What's my weakness? Like a big time weakness that a guy like a Gerald Swindle or someone that has, has been there and done that for 20 more years, like knows like, okay, this, this is what I can do to go get bites when I don't have any pattern whatsoever. Like, like I'm, I'm still trying to figure out when I don't find the hub, when, when I don't have a home base or a comfort zone, like, like how do I still survive those tournaments? Yeah. When you're looking at that, I mean, that's, that's why, why, you know, that's why those guys are the best in the world because they figure out how to survive those tournaments. For sure. And when you're looking for that hub, then are you purposely going to the tournament saying, Hey, I'm going to check a lot of different areas to find that 200 yard to a mile stretch or is it just that you're going to go to areas where you know the traditionally the tournaments are won at or where like i'm going to do a lot of research so dude i've been, been in the industry for for 15, 15 years i pretty, pretty much know guys the guys, guys who are around different, different areas, areas right, right? so yeah, i'm, I'm going to talk to as many guys as long as it's legal and it's in practice that i know who know the lake i'm going to say i'm going to say give me some generals like if you were to pick this, this is, is this exactly, exactly how I'll do it, man. If, if you were to pick, pick a, the safest section of the lake uh, that you feel confident at this time of year, you can do whatever weight the target on you is, yeah. 13 to 15 pounds or 10 to 12 pounds, and not have to run anywhere else, what section of the lake is that going to be? If you talk to two or three different guys, you'll find they start overlapping, right? Mm. Um, and, and then, then you, you start, start pulling BFL results and tournament results, and you start looking at like other websites that, that, that have any sort of results and you start putting it all together. And then all of a sudden you realize, okay, this is a, this is a good, this is a fertile section of the lake that historically plays. So the odds are that there's going to be a solid bite in this section of the lake. Um, and then that's the part of the lake that I'm going to go focus on. I, I don't like to get, typically, I don't like to get tons of waypoints, or if I do, so I'll tell you, if I do, I'll say, give me two waypoints in here that just kind of explain what this area is, right? Yep. That give me confidence. So I can go to it and say, okay, even if there's not fish there now, this is an area that they historically set up on that they've been caught on before, whether it's a a stretch of bank or a, something offshore or a brush pile the way it sets up and that just gives me an idea right there yeah so now i know i'm in a productive area of the lake looking at something that the fish historically live on and then you can build from there that's really cool stuff and then once you get into those areas are you testing a lot of different patterns as well shallow deep yeah tons I'm, t I'm using stuff to get bites now i'm trying to get bites that's why i'm a big like wacky worm guy drop shot uh 1.0s 
uh, stuff that gets bites. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to just go lob a negotiator out there and be like, oh, well, no eight pounders. Like, I'm trying to get bites because remember what I said before, like a lot of these 80% of these tournaments that I'm fishing, I'm trying to catch a solid limit because a solid limit puts you way in the top percentage and keeps you in it for the next tournament. Gotcha. And it's whether that, you know, that's a shaky head. If it's your confidence bait, it's a shaky head, a yep. square bill, whatever it is, you know, whatever, based on the type of stuff that you're fishing. But I'm, I'm putting something in that more often than not is going to get a bite. Well, and that's one thing that I've talked about before is like, when I think those fish that we talked about those feeding windows earlier in the stream, if you hit those feeding windows, right? Like that first day you were back in that Creek on Cumberland and yep. you just wrecked them on the crankbait. That might have just been you hit the timing right when they were up totally. actively Front feeding. came in and started yeah. raining sideways. No one else was back there. If you go back and watch my video, it's actually on the AFCO, uh, AFCO YouTube channel. If you watch that first day of practice, it was like gnarly, and I was the only one cranking bluffs in Indian Creek that day. <laughs> and then it got tough, but like I saw what the potential was there. I mean, I had like 19 pounds, 19 to 20 pounds on that first day of practice, and I build on it. Yep. Then it got sunny and slick and stuff, but I was looking ahead at the weather. So I had built on that because I saw what the potential was and how they how they sat on the stuff. Yeah, and, and it's, it was lucky. Well, but but at the same time, you hit that um, that feeding window right, and you were using the right bait at the right time. At the same mm -hmm. time, though, I always talk about like if let's say there's a feeding window at, right before that front at noon, and then at five o'clock there's another feeding window right before the sun goes down. In between mm -hmm. there. I feel like those fish maybe aren't as aggressive. And if you go through there with a crankbait, you might get one bite or get a fish to push it or follow it, but you might not actually catch them. The way I think about it is kind of like, let's say that you're going, it's a Sunday and you are eating lunch at noon and then you eat lunch at five o'clock. So you had your after church meal, you ate up and you're full. And then you're going to eat maybe something before you start watching football. But in between there, maybe there's some games on you want to watch. And if I come by with a Kit Kat bar, for you in the middle of that that time there's a pretty good chance you're going to eat that because you're like oh, i'll take a kit kat that's how i think about a drop shot and a shaky head it's like you're giving them that bait that maybe they want to eat a crankbait or a jig or something like that when they're in that feeding mode but when they're not yeah. the drop shot the shaky head gives them that kind of little taste and that's yeah, where you yeah. can dial in those areas if you're not in a good feeding window throwing those baits as your search baits can actually be effective despite the fact that Maybe you wouldn't want to throw those tournament day, but you're searching with a finesse bait, which I think is very different from what a lot of people do. They think search baits, crank baits, spinner baits, jigs. They don't think when I'm looking for fish, throw the most finessey thing you can get away with. But here's the thing: I'm throw. I like to throw a drop shot, a Ned rig, and I don't really throw a shaky head a ton anymore. But a drop shot, a Ned rig, but I'll have the trolling motor on like seven or eight. Yeah, exactly. And just hitting high percentage stuff. I'm yep. not like sitting there crawling. And I'm like covering water with it. That happened at the Arkansas River. I was I was power fishing. Yep. I was like, dude, I know these fish are here this past weekend. Pulled the drop shot out. Seven of the ten I weighed in came on a drop shot with a six inch leader and a six inch worm. It's it's not fishing any different from how you normally would. It's mm -hmm. just changing your baits because yep. you're catching those inactive fish as yep. well as the active fish. And if you can even get those bites, if you come back in that area again when that feeding window's on, pre-front or whatever, then you can smash them. But if you can get three bites, kind of like in the beach area, you got maybe one or two bites on a stretch of grass. Well, maybe they were just 12 inches, but then when you actually go out the next day, if you hit it at the right time, those two 12 inches turn into three, four pounders. Yeah. And it can, I guess it can I can like kind of summarize everything. Like I feel, uh, and this is just me, like, I mean, I've fished tournaments since I was 14. Like I said, I suck in a lot of them. I'm not on the Elite Series. I'm doing decent in the Open. I had a decent year last year. You know, I'm not saying this is the end-all, be-all, Johnny, of how things are done. I'm just saying how it works for me. Yeah. But, like, if, if I have to try to convince myself that I've got a pattern going or that I'm doing the right thing, like – if you have to try to talk yourself into that you got something going, typically not going to end well. Yeah. And you need to keep searching. And it's really easy to do that because you can look back and be like, oh, I had a four pounder there and I caught him there. Like, man, I've, I've done good. Like if you have to convince yourself that you're going to catch him, you're not going to catch him. Yep. And that's, that's 
I think one of the things that you have to get your butt kicked for several years and fish a lot of tournaments going into tournaments with that feeling to realize like, okay, I need to adjust it because I've gone into enough now where like, here's another key. If I'm going, if I'm at the dock and there's other guys loading at the end of the day and I'm like, look it over to see what they have tied on. Even if I caught them, I'm not going to catch them. Yeah. Cause I'm, I care what they have tied on. Like literally when I have, a, a good pattern, a spoke and a hub, and I'm confident and I know what's going on. I'm not sitting there going, am I going to catch him? Or am I going to not? I'm literally just going, okay, let's make sure my, my batteries are charged. Let's make sure everything works right. The trolling motor, let's make sure there's no nicks in the line, that the hooks are super. That's all I'm worried about. I'm not worried about where I'm starting or what I'm doing. And when I'm pulling up to, to load the boat, I'm typically putting my all my rods away, and I really don't care what anyone else has tied on because I think I can catch them on what I've got, and I don't want to put something else in my head. And so those are two like good kind of litmus tests for me as to whether I'm trying to convince myself and whether I'm not trying to convince myself. That's really good stuff, and I think that there's a lot of guys in the chat here who are agreeing with kind of, or at least they really appreciate yeah, I your opinion. Seen any of the chat maybe they're just like dude shut this guy no up. no they're loving it um they're saying i'm too cocky but other than that um that's all that, uh, that i ever that, you that, are. that i am apparently me talking about my college wins is uh not going over well with the audience but You're living uh, in the past johnny living the past you gotta live in the fish the moment live the moment <laughs> um but otherwise other than that but yeah the uh the dan uh ham says here eliminating options and decisions is an awesome concept eliminating areas methods and bait seems daunting matt's idea is just seems much more doable and i think yeah. that that is very true especially because like for myself when i mean i'm on fishing tournaments now i'm planning on getting back into some tournament stuff fish some opens maybe stuff like that right. but i fished a hundred and like 30 tournaments before the age of 20 so i right. fished a lot of tournaments i also sucked a lot and I mm-hmm. lost a lot, and I learned a lot of lessons in that, which then led me to when I was doing like my college stuff, I was able to to have, like you said, that clear mind. Where if you only have fished 10, 15, 20 tournaments in your life, and you haven't fished for more than maybe three or four years, it, there's so many options. And every single time you pull up YouTube video, it's like, oh, here's how I catch them on a flutter spoon or a yeah. swim bait or whatever. And it's like, what am I supposed to do? And I've got to the point where I was, when I go out fishing nowadays, I basically try to catch him on a jig, a crankbait, and a worm. And that's it. If I can catch him on like a, a shaky head, like Neko rig, drop shot, yep. or a jig or a crankbait, I'm going to catch him. If I'm not catching him on one of those baits, then either I stumbled on something and got lucky, or I am way off base and I'm not going to catch yep. him. And that's That'll something work. that probably is similar for you. I know you have confidence baits as well, and it's just you don't know what a confidence bait is until you spend a lot of time doing it. But – if you can maybe block out all the noise and maybe stop watching every YouTube video about every single technique and dial in those few techniques you really enjoy, it might help you become a little bit better fisherman. Maybe, you know, observe the techniques, but maybe not have to go out and implement every single one. Because, I mean, of all the available techniques, Matt, how many do you use on a monthly basis? Like, how many different styles of techniques would you use? Not many. Yeah. Not many. It's the same here. Like I said, it, this Rayburn was so unique because it was the first time that I punched grass. Now, I mean, dude, I flipped and stuff before. It's not like I'd never seen grass. I've been out with guys and covered tournaments and all that stuff. But it was the first time that I that I had, and I missed fish, and I'm sure I made some mistakes, but it worked out. But as a whole, man, it's 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 stuff you develop confidence in, and especially if you're new and you're just getting into it, like. Do some research. Figure out what's typically good and figure out like how to how to throw it and stuff. I mean, don't just stick with, oh, I know how to Texas rig a worm. Like get a good repertoire that you feel comfortable with and then on and, and start exploring at first. And then all of a sudden you'll be like, Oh, I really like that, or I really like this. And then you can go down the YouTube wormhole and learn all about it and spend time on the water. But Pond fish, catch fish on a number of different things, figure out what you like, stick with it, eliminate your options. I mean, go to the Cumberland map again. Yep. I mean, dude, it's the first year I've fished it. We take out here, I've got all this. How the hell am I going to beat Brian Thrift on this body of water? How am I going to beat Troy Morrow? Dude, I know it's going to take 15 to 17 to win this thing. 
I had 15 to 17 pounds of bites down here. I don't care what Brian Thrift and Troy Morrow were doing here with a 3.3 inch Kai Tech on a spinning rod on 45 degree angle bluffs and chasing school and fish and flat fish. Dude, I can compete right here in this little thing, not knowing anything about the rest of the entire lake. Yep. That's, That's all it comes down to. And anybody can too. Yep. And pick up those confidence baits. Pick up your Carolina rigs, yep. your spooks, and just go fishing. And what else yep. do you need to throw? <laughs> take the jeffrey's approach on it yeah um cool well matt this is super super good stuff i mean i think everyone on the stream seems to be really loving it one thing that uh someone suggested here uh dave dalton says he really um would be interested to see how you actually break down the lake and one thing that i plan on doing guys going forward i know a lot of you guys, a lot of you guys really enjoy when i used to do my live streams where i just literally pulled up a lake map of random lakes and just started breaking down the lakes talking about where when mm -hmm. how to fish I plan on doing that here every single week going forward. Every Tuesday, we're going to be bringing back the live stream, and we're going to be doing that format. And I'm actually going to be using my Patreon members to suggest the lakes. I'm going to be picking two lakes every single week for the live stream. And I'm going to have myself breaking them down, Randy and Matt. If you love, if you want to come back, I think we'd love to have you maybe show us how to break down the lake. We can just pull up a random lake map and show you know maybe how you find fish in the fall on I'm Clark's Hill. <laughs> Hey, hey, we got we, we can learn. I think we can learn from everyone. I think people would enjoy it. All right, but we will we will see. Um, but I think that'd be really fun. And you know, in general, I think that in fishing, you can't get enough opinions. There's no one who knows everything. It's just, I mean, I've made that clear in my videos. Like, I am terrible at shallow water fishing. I don't, I I feel like I'm really good at offshore fishing in certain situations. Randy is really good at shallow water fishing in a lot of situations, but he doesn't know the offshore game. And Matt, you have a really good perspective on the mental side and the approach of these tournaments. So like there's things that you can learn that I feel like everyone has a pretty good grasp on. And the more and more we can learn from others, I think is really important. So definitely get as much information as you can from other people. I learn just as much from talking to a 15 or 13 year old kid that I might go fishing with because they might fish a certain bait a way that I've never seen it as I can from a tour pro a lot of times, just because I have an open mind. So definitely keep an open mind on all this. Listen to what Matt has to say because it is super valuable information and I'm gonna start adopting a lot of this stuff too. And we're gonna be talking about the hub and spoke. I think we'll make, make a dedicated video on that, Matt, as well yeah, as you're your- start sucking a lot more if you start listening to everything <laughs> like that too. No, it's good, it's good stuff. Like I said, that's the problem that I'm trying to figure out and I don't have a solution to it. Because when you miss it, you really miss it. Yeah. Like there is no salvaging. Like it, you see what you know what I'm saying there? Yeah. Well, one question. As I said, that's part two. That's the next. That's the next scenario. Once I figure out how to miss it, once you don't figure out the the <laughs> hub and spoke deal, then we'll be then we'll actually be cooking. Then we'll be able to 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 go places. Well, we'll keep tabs with you on that too to see how you figure that out. I think that would be Yo. interesting. You know, one question from JD, he says, uh, in the past tournaments that you've won in practice, did you have a good feeling that you were going to win or no? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought I, thought I could, I could win, win Cumberland. Cumberland. Like, like I actually said, said it's in the video that I did. I was like, dude, I'd be really disappointed if I didn't do well here. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I haven't won many big tournaments. Let's, let's alter that to say solid finishes okay <laughs> yeah i rarely had a solid finish out of nowhere hmm. like I, i've always had something that kind of clicked gotcha like i haven't had i mean i have i have in the past like you know deals where it just is brutal all day and your stuff doesn't work you pull up on a bridge with five minutes left to catch 12 pounds on three drops that's yep. happened. Um, but as a whole, a good finish against a strong field, you rarely get lucky. Yeah. Because there's enough talent that outweighs the luck. You might have a lucky fish or two, but that's the difference between a 30th and a top 10 finish. Yep. Um, it's really hard to, to go in and, and get lucky and go from a 90th place finish to a check. And just to kind of context that, you're talking about like open level tournaments, multi-day yeah. tournaments. You're not talking yeah. about like a BFL jack or like, you know, and BFLs are even tough to win, but like, but like, 
yeah, like, like a of jackpot tournament. or like a you know just a whatever. Yeah, those are yeah. different. I would say it's talking the same. about a tournament you've prepared for, you've done research, you've put a game plan together, you've really have a vested interest in this tournament. Those are the type of tournaments I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone can go out and win a thirty dollar jackpot tournament by just pulling up on the bank and getting lucky. It's hard to be consistent. Multi day tournaments with a high caliber angler. Exactly. Yeah. But no, that, this is super interesting stuff, Matt. I just really appreciate you joining me for the stream. I think that we got a lot of good information out of this. I need to go back and take some notes on this because I like I have some stuff I'm thinking about with this whole like hub and spoke and like I want I need to figure some of the stuff out. I'm going to talk to you after the stream and we'll figure this out too. But you you have some really cool ideas and I think that uh, you know really appreciate everything you share on Bass Talk Live. You and Jeffries do a great job there interviewing the pros and you always have really really good discussion so thanks so much for all that work and also i'll just say if if your listeners are good with uh with randy's theories they can sure handle some of my abstract theories (laughs) and i say that as a compliment randy is one of my favorite guests on btl and uh i don't know does he even drink a beer like when he sit down and drink a beer i don't know if he's a I, I don't even know, actually. I haven't, we haven't anyway, maybe reached that He's the that guy that yet. I would love to sit yeah. down and drink a cold glass of sweet tea with and discuss <laughs> some stuff, you know, off camera because I, I really I really like getting into that kind of mental aspect of it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, guys, again, thanks for joining for the stream. One last uh, deal. I just want to make sure we drop a plug in at the end. You got to plug stuff. We don't have the commercial, the fancy commercials. You guys have a BTL. All right. Just a uh, reminder that we do have some virtual seminars coming up here, guys. We got the advanced jerkbait seminar from Randy on October 8th. He's going to go through the best conditions, the best structure, areas, everything you know about jerkbait fishing. I'm excited to watch this because I suck at jerkbait fishing. So I'm excited to <laughs> be uh, moderating on this. And then we're going to be doing an offshore bass fishing, advanced offshore bass fishing class with me on October 22nd. Where we're talking about how to become a more efficient and effective offshore angler. Kind of focus more for those tournament guys who are maybe struggling to consistently do well offshore. And maybe you're hitting your timing wrong. You're not finding enough spots in a day. Maybe you're not adapting the conditions I'm going to be talking about all the factors that are going to change how the fish bite from weather conditions, sun angles, the current flow, um, fishing pressure, how all those things affect the fish and how you can become a really efficient and effective offshore angler. And then we also have an advanced bass fishing electronics class coming up November 12th. And I'll be going through how to actually use your side imaging, down imaging 2D sonar to determine if fish are on a spot, if they're actively feeding, and if you should even make a cast there. I've got to the point recently where I'm graphing for five, six hours a day, and I'm only fishing for two hours out of my day. And I might make 100, 150 casts, and I'm catching 30 fish. So that's a pretty good percentage of casts to catch, but it's a lot of graphing. And I think that if you guys check out this class, it'll definitely help you become a more efficient electronics fisherman if you're into that kind of stuff so uh those are some of the classes and that's all for that so anyways again thanks matt for joining me tonight and definitely tune in to bass talk live again it is on the apple podcast app spotify pretty much everywhere you can find your podcasts just go to bass talk live matt and mark jeffries they are really really great interviewers and just really uh interesting guys to listen to while you're driving to the lake stuff like that and also check out BassZone.com. Matt does a lot of great work there, articles, just good way to keep up with tournament bass fishing if you have some time where you just want to learn stuff about bass fishing. So again, Matt, thanks so much for joining me on the stream. Thanks, and, Johnny. Uh, hopefully we can have you back on. Hope we didn't scare you away from the stream. No, no I hope, hope I didn't scare everyone else away. <laughs> good stuff. Well, anyways, thanks again, guys, and have a great night. We good? good.